I've grown native plants a long time, but I still ask, what should we do in summer for the ones that bloom in fall? Should we prune or not? To put us in the know, San Antonio native plant designer and wildlife steward, Drake White, preps us for a new season. Hi, Drake, it is so great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this uh, opportunity to educate others. First, Drake, tell us about you. I am the owner of the Nectar Bar, which is a um, local native uh, landscape company um, and, and small nursery. And what I do is I create habitat for pollinators and wildlife. I'm a Texas master naturalist, and I'm also a member of the Native Plant Society. I enjoy doing education things for children and, uh, well, children of all ages, <laughs> um, because we should always strive to continue to learn and educate ourselves throughout life. Why are you so committed to designing and planting for wildlife? I think it's really important, especially for our pollinators. Without pollinators, we don't have plants, really. That's the gist of it. A lot of it is, you know, talked about that, oh, you know, one of uh, every bite that we eat um, is created by a pollinator. Um, but the realistic of it is, if we don't have pollinators, we don't have plants. So, and if we don't have plants, we don't have a lot of things. And with that also comes that, hey, you know what, since it's native, not much care really needs to go into it. Yes, you have to get it established, but you don't need to really water it so much. Most of them will die if you water them too much. So it's really like, hey, who doesn't want to save water? We definitely want to save water. And in our heat, it just thrives. I always look forward to fall. It's my favorite season because after we've gone through a grueling August, I really welcome the change of season, but also all the colors and all the wildlife. So why is it important to have fall blooming flowers, not just spring flowers, which are great, but why should we have fall flowers? Well, fall flowers are really important because it helps many things. One with migration, the monarch butterfly, they need a lot of fall flowers just to um, kind of fatten themselves up with nutrition to continue their journey to Mexico but also with other pollinators, other butterflies need to kind of get themselves ready to go into what they call a diapause or a hibernation of such. They kind of hibernate over and leaf litter and things like that. So it's really important for all wildlife to kind of get prepared for fall as, or for winter in the fall. So in order to do that, we have to kind of do our part to make sure that that's available for them. So to kind of help them a little bit after the brutal summer, what are some plants that we should prune and how much and why do we do that? Okay, so typically what I like to say, um, your time frame in, in pruning for fall would be between June 1st and the mid to third week of August. Um, and what you want to do is whatever, certain, there's different plants would take different things. So for example, frost week, June 1st or that first week of June, whatever its height is, you would cut it by half. And what that's going to do, it's going to bush out, become healthier, thicker stem, and give you multiple flower heads, which is what the, the monarchs um, need during their migration. It is definitely a fall bloomer to start um, blooming for you around the end of August, beginning September. Um, and that's really important. One of their main staples that they choose, a lot of things get really late. Your different salvias, flame acanthus, maximilian sunflowers, all of those are ones that are probably looking kind of scraggly right now. So looking at what you have in your space, you'll see the ones that are kind of sticking out really late, and you'll take it back to where the most bushiest part is. So it could either be by half or it could be maybe just a couple of inches. You just kind of have to stand back and see where the fullest part of your plant is and trim it back to that part. That way more flowers will come, even if it has flowers. People are so afraid. They're like, oh, but it has flowers and, and the hummingbirds are using it right now. So those 10 flowers that you may have or 20 flowers that you may have, if you trim those off, you'll have 30 to 40 because it doesn't have to spend the energy getting into those ones that are long and leggy and keeping that alive. It can say, okay, here, boom, give all that energy into new growth 
and new flowers, which are more in abundance, and it's a healthier plant. Does that apply to Turk's cap as well? Should, could we kind of trim those off? Mine are getting already really leggy. Yes, um, Turk's cap as well. And depending on how high, um, some people have this year, you know, this year is just an abundance for, for plants, even with, with the big freeze that we had. Um, a lot of our natives have made it and they have drawn just gangbusters. Um, my Turk's cap also is very leggy and it's about six foot tall, which typically it never has been over three feet. So what I will definitely be doing here in the next couple of weeks is trimming that by half or at least hip height for myself. Um, so maybe about three foot tall, I'll cut it back in by half in my space. Um, in your own space that you may have, you can kind of judge, but yeah, you'll, it'll definitely push out. Because sometimes too, when it tends to get so leggy, it falls over um, and we don't want that too. So by cutting that, you're creating a healthier stem and it's not top heavy to fall over and break. How light can we go? Say we don't get a chance to do this until the last week of August, maybe even, you know, say Labor Day week. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Maybe if it's that late, you may not want to cut it as drastically, but trim off, you can always trim off a little bit, step back, see how it looks. You can always trim a little bit more. Wonderful. Now with native plants, do we need to fertilize them? Do we need to kind of pump them up a little bit? This is a wonderful question about do we need to fertilize native plants? So I say the only thing that you could do to kind, or you, you, you may want to do, um, is actually just give it some good compost. I mean, some really, really good compost. If you're feeding them a chemical fertilizer, most likely it's not gonna be happy with it and it may not survive at all. They don't like chemical fertilizers. And many of times, um, especially those that are, are new to it, don't know how to correctly um, measure out that and sometimes they burn the plant. So it's better, you can never burn the plant. You can't put too much. You can't do any of that with a natural, just compost with some good worm castings or things like that. That's much easier, much better, and actually healthier um, for your native plants. And that probably should be done three times a year. So you'll wanna do it, you know, come maybe September 1st, and then just kind of go, you know, every three months. Fall is also the best time to plant new plants, uh, to get them established over the winter. Nurseries will have them in the fall because they're blooming. And so you can see how they look and you can get your color combinations together. Why should we plant in fall? And also maybe give us an idea, something for sun, something for shade, something for like a tiny little bed, like, you know, those little tiny pocket beds at the front porch or uh, for a container? One reason why you would want to plant in fall um, and not really so much in summer is because it can't, it can't do both. It can't get itself established and protect itself from the heat and weather that we have here. We've been lucky this year. We've had kind of not so bad um, summer, but it, we're not finished yet. <laughs> so there's no way that it can do both. It can't grow its new roots and establish itself and protect itself from the harsh uh, weather elements that it can hit um, during our hot summer. So fall is definitely the best. Trees, you definitely should only plant in fall and in winter. Um, come spring, it's a little bit too late. A few plants that I could definitely suggest, milkweed. For me, you can never have enough native milkweed. So fall and spring, you should always plant at least a couple of them. Fall plants, I would say your fall asters, Flame acanthus is just, I mean, for everything from hummingbirds to butterflies to a host plant for caterpillars. I mean, you win all the way around with that one. And it takes li literally like no maintenance. And then frostweed. So it's definitely a staple for the monarchs during migration. It does this cool little thing. If we were to get a freeze, it busts at the seams and shows you little ice ribbons, but it's also a host plant for the border patch butterflies. Some of those things that I just mentioned, the frostweed, the uh, fall aster, and the flame acanthus, you can do in either sun or shade um, or dappled. Um, so you'll get more blooms with the flame acanthus definitely in the sun, um, and it won't get as many blooms, but it will still bloom in, in a dappled shade 
Turk's cap absolutely loves um, dappled shade and it can somewhat do sun, uh, but it can't bake all day longer. It's not really happy. It gets kind of, mm, I don't know about that. But frostweed, frostweed definitely, I mean, even if you're out in your na natural areas, out on a hike, you'll see it. It's in understory. It's definitely in shade and dappled sun areas. And another one that would do really good in sun or shade um, is snake herb. And snake herb is a little ground cover uh, with purple flowers. It's also a host plant for the um, common buckeye butterfly. Um, it doesn't grow really much taller than about six inches max. And it'll spread out and be a nice little ground cover um, for anywhere that you have in shade, but it also grows in sun. So you get a double bonus, but you can also have small spaces or even in containers. A lot of people think, oh, I, I live in a small condo um, or I have a townhouse and I don't have much of a yard, but you can plant even, even what we like to call a, a way station <laughs> in a pot. So if you have like a 16 inch to a 20 inch um, round pot, you can actually put a frost weed um, in zizotes or Texana um, milkweed, which they do well in pots. Um, and then something that everyone I feel must have is mist flower. So if you have Greg's mist flower, you have those three things, you have created a healthy ecosystem in a plant on your porch um, or on your patio, and you are now servicing and helping wildlife as well. So whether you have a huge yard, acreage, a small backyard, a small planting spot, or just you can only do it in a pot, everyone can as absolutely plant for wildlife and for butterflies. So when you mentioned milkweed, what are the native ones that you mentioned? Um, I know they're hard to source, but what are the ones that maybe we could look at? And then what is your uh, feeling about the tropical, the Mexican milkweed, the debate on whether we should cut them back early or, or not? What, what's your take on that? With native milkweeds, um, here in, 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 in Bear County, it's going to kind of differ depending on where you're at and, you're, and it's for every state. Or I should even say it's for every country because there's milkweed in every country and it's important to those areas. In my experience, the ones that do the absolute best are the antelope horn, green antelope horn, zizotes, and Texas milkweed. Um, those are your absolute best. And out of those, your zizotes and your texana are going to be the ones that do fabulous in pots. They're okay in pots. And the bonus with that is that you don't need to bring them inside if we're going to get a freeze. Just leave them out. They're fine with it and they're going to survive and they're still going to grow back. Now with your tropical milkweeds, it's not native. Many people have already bought it or they're willing to buy it because it's so readily available um, in the nurseries. And the number one thing that I see is that, well, it's got aphids, I'm not touching it. I don't want something that has all those aphids on it. And I'm actually saying, yes, you do. <laughs> you do, because that tells you that it's clean milkweed. And what I mean by clean milkweed is the fact that there are no pesticides on that. Um, ladybugs, lace wings, um, hoverfly larva, all that will take care of your um, aphids. You don't need to do anything to it. Um, even sometimes the caterpillars purposely eat the aphids, I recommend cutting it back twice a year. June 1st, cut it down to the ground. And the reason why I say this is because spring migration has brought all of the plants together or all of the uh, butterflies together that can actually drop the OE spore on that. Um, and so we want healthy milkweed for the fall migration. So if we actually cut it back, because it's not going to die back for us in the summer, like our native milkweeds, sometimes die back. So if they die back and they grow back, it's fresh new growth that's ready for the fall migrating monarchs that may break dormancy and sexual diapause and then lay their eggs um, on that plant. So we want fresh, healthy um, plants available for that. So if you have that, even if it has flowers, I promise you, you'll get more flowers. It'll be a bushier, healthier um, plant and it'll be clean enough for any, um, uh, monarchs that may lay eggs, but also your queens. Um, and then again, you'll trim it for the second time um, in December. Um, well, I guess depending where you're at. So if you're kind of um, here, I always cut it back around December 1st and I just keep it cut back until January 1st because um, we can still be quite warm <laughs> um, all through December and things grow really, really well because it's not so hot. 
Um, so yeah, I just keep cutting it back and I leave it cut back um, and it just bushes out and bushes out. Um, so I recommend here in Bear County just to cut it back um, December 1st, but some people that are further out and it gets colder quicker, um, you may want to cut that back starting first of August or first of October um, into mid October. So anywhere between October 1st and December 1st is when you should definitely be cutting it back. You're also involved with a really fun family event in San Antonio. People from all over the state and perhaps even from all over the country attend. It's called the Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. This year, it's going to be an in-person event once again on October 16th in Confluence Park. So tell us more about this. We are so excited to finally be able to come back in person. Um, I am the chief docent manager um, I, I basically educate the volunteers that will be helping um, tag and, and release the butterflies to educate people. If you've never done it, I mean, just to have the experience yourself is fabulous. Um, but the fact that we actually get to teach people why, yes, you know, the butterfly and getting to have that experience is, is the wow factor. They actually get to learn why it happens. A lot of people don't know that there's a two-way migration. And when they find out, this also inspires them. Well, I want to be involved. How do I get involved? So many questions are asked, even by little ones. And I love it. Like, well, where does it go? Well, it's going to Mexico. It's a wonderful family event. Are you going to wear your butterfly wings again? Absolutely. I'm always ready with my wings. <laughs> well, I hope people can come on down to that. In the meantime, how can they follow you on social media or your website? so that they can learn more of your tips all the time or get involved with you um, in San Antonio. They can see me on Instagram and Facebook. I have both. And then also uh, go to my webpage as well. This is so inspiring. I learn so much. And I know that our viewers will too. And our pollinators will all be very thankful. So really, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Peace, love, and butterflies.